Okay, so in this lecture, uh, I'm going to talk about the second piece of coursework in this module, um, which is an e-commerce website. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction, overview, explain what the project's all about. Then I'm going to talk about the two submissions that you have to make for the project, and then I'm going to explain in detail how it's going to be assessed. Right, so it's a group project. Um, I'm going to explain what that means a little bit. Um, and it's going to be worth 30% uh, of the overall mark for the module. So as you'd expect, we're going to mark the project out of 100 and then scale that uh, mark down to a mark between uh, 0 and 30. Now, to some extent, each person's uh, individual mark reflects their contribution to the project. So the project will be marked, and then I'm going to explain how that mark will be kind of weighted or changed up or down depending on how much work people actually contributed. So deadlines, uh, the first submission um, will be the end of week 16, the final submission the end of week 23. So these deadlines in this talk, uh, I'm just going to give you the, like, the week by week. The exact deadlines um, will be given um, in the project description, which is available on the course website, and I'll tell you a bit more about that a little later. So it's an e-commerce website. So you've all used, you know, I imagine, you know, computer science students or whatever, right? You, you, you've used websites to buy stuff, right? So you bought tickets, maybe you bought uh, holidays, flights, uh, you know, maybe you bought batteries, uh, maybe you bought your pets online, I don't know. Um, and the general idea is common to all of these, right? You add items to a basket, you enter some personal details so they can send you the stuff, tickets, whatever, then you click uh, buy now, and then, um, and then you typically enter your credit card details and then you get, get your stuff, right? Instantly or through the post. Now, what we're gonna focus on in this project is implementing the sort of the browsing, the searching functionality, and the sort of entering the customer details and the basket. Um, but we're not gonna worry about taking money, okay? Please don't use PayPal or SagePay, whatever it is, uh, to take money from the, from the people using your website. Don't store any credit cards, anything like that. You're not going to go there. There's a lot of regulations surrounding all of that. I'm going to focus on the front-end functionality and the back-end functionality, not on taking money. And don't waste your time trying to send confirmation emails. Again, that's a little tricky, and you can get caught up in, you know, when I tried to, I tried to get this working, and it's like uh, sort of send mail. If you have a send mail program on your PC, your antivirus picks it up. It all gets a bit tricky. So we're not going to send confirmation emails and not going to take any money, but all the core functionality you need to implement. You're also going to have a content management system. So in a real company, you have the front end of the website that the customer sees and interacts with, but you also need a back end so that, it, like in the warehouse, for example, the staff can add products to the website or edit products or keep up updates, stock counts, and so on and so forth. If you phone up Amazon, whatever, they'll probably ignore you. But if you manage to get through to someone, um, then the, the person talking to you would need to be able to see your previous orders. And again, they're going to use a content management system for that. And I'll explain what that means in a little bit. You're also going to do a customer tracking recommendation. Pretty much any modern website these days is providing some, has some kind of tracking going on in the background so that they can uh, recommend products to you um, based upon your browsing history or purchase history or, you know, and also they generate recommendations based on like seasonal events and so on and so forth. And uh, the customers themselves are gonna have to have the ability to register on the website and view their previous orders. So the front end is gonna be written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, um, exactly what you were using for your first piece of coursework. You know, one piece of coursework's designed to build on the next, uh, on previous ones, sorry. Um, you're gonna store, so you, you might find it useful to use HTML uh, local storage or session storage, but it's not a requirement of this uh, particular assignment. So you might want to use HTML local session storage for customer tracking recommendation. You might want to use it for the basket, but there's no obligation to. Server side scripts have all going to be written in PHP. If you've, if you've got like, if you're a dab hand at .NET and decide to write it in .NET, then you'll get no marks, okay? It's a PHP project. You have to write the server side scripts in PHP. And persistent data on the server must be stored in MongoDB. This course is uh, teaching you how to use MongoDB and NoSQL database based on JSON, as I'll explain in the next lecture. So if you think, ah, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I learned uh, SQL, I'll probably get away with using SQL on this, on this project. Uh, well, the answer is a categorical no, okay? Any data 
any functionality that's implemented in a different database using a different database, you just get zero marks for it. So it'd be a complete waste of your time using anything except MongoDB on this site. Now, there are marks for Ajax in this project. I'll explain what that means, but Ajax is a way in which JavaScript can talk directly to the server um, without reloading the page. Um, so you're going to use that a bit in this project, and you're going to use it a lot um, for your single web page web application um, in Coursework 3. So you're welcome to use libraries and frameworks such as jQuery, Bootstrap, AngularJS. So I covered a bunch of frameworks and libraries um, in a previous lecture. Any of those you're very welcome to use. And many other frameworks and libraries you're also welcome to use, um, but you need to check with your module leader, okay? Because um, publishing platforms and content management systems such as WordPress, Laravel, and Joomla are not allowed, okay? These are, you know, they're not going to do all the fun. Well, Laravel might do a lot of the functionality for you, but the other ones you're probably going to have to adapt a lot. But I want you to learn how to do these things, you know, pretty much from scratch so that you understand what you're doing when you come to implement other projects. So if you just try and, you know, use a content management system and use the basket and e-commerce functionality within that, you're not going to learn anything, okay? So you're not allowed to use any of these. If you use them, um, you just get no marks, okay? Um, if you want to get some marks, so be very careful about using libraries and frameworks that I haven't covered in the lecture. Just double check with me or with, with your module leader. So there's no marks in this project uh, for data complexity. Um, you need to have enough data, enough products, so that the user can plausibly search for products and plausibly, you know, sort them by price, relevance, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I'm not going to give you extra marks if you have like a thousand products in your database instead of having just ten products in your database. So I recommend, to make your life easier, um, that you focus on a fairly limited set of products. So instead of trying to build some kind of super complex clothing store with like trousers, shirts, skirts, dresses, hats, ties, so on and so forth, um, maybe just have a t-shirt uh, website instead. Again, instead of all the sort of multifarious types of electronics, maybe just focus on a laptop store or a phone store, something like that. And instead of having groceries with like, you know, meat, fish, potatoes, so on and so forth, lots of categories, really complicated, maybe just focus on apples or fruit. So yeah, in the previous first year around this course, you know, there was like a weird number of uh, fruit, fruit stores. But uh, never mind, if people want to sell fruit, you're welcome to sell fruit. You want to sell elephants, pets, I don't really care. But the point is, keep it restricted because it'll make your life easier. That's the main point. So, let's have a little look at some examples. So, here we have uh, Asda. For some reason my mouse not working. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, I've uh, never used Asda, so I'm not logged in, but you get the general idea, right? That... Um, you know, a bunch of products, it's got some kind of search functionality and a return results matching that search. You click on add, it'll add it to the basket here, and then you have some kind of checkout and so on and so forth. So no, you know, I'm not much of a fan of Asda, but you know, it, it sort of lets you just view the goods without registering, which is why I use the example. Now, Amazon's a different, different matter, right? I really like Amazon, um, and it's a very successful website. So I'm not, you know, sponsored by Amazon, but I use it a lot. Um, and so this, in my view, is, is the sort of ideal kind of modern website. So firstly, you know, if you, since Amazon is so successful, if you copy the way Amazon does things, you can be pretty sure it's going to work with customers. Um, and I think it works rather nicely. So here's the Amazon homepage. Um, and already we've got recommendations, because I was buying some stuff for the pond, I think, you know, stop the fish being killed by the tap water, whatever. So it's generating recommendations in specific categories based on my browsing history. And also, if you look at adverts, Amazon adverts, like in Facebook, for example, then they'll be using this data that they pulled from their own site to generate those adverts that are targeted you know, specifically at you kind of thing. Now, if we look, um, then we've got this kind of open search. Now, Amazon's got a very smart open search. So you can type any old random stuff in here. And if it plausibly matches some kind of goods they sell, it'll almost certainly find it. And then the result will be on the first page. So I'm going to explain to you um, how to use MongoDB for this kind of open search. You can kind of index kind of keywords or descriptions of your products so that MongoDB will enable you to do sort of match, sort of keyword matches um, within your products um, in the same way that Amazon does. So I would recommend that you base your website around this kind of search bar because Amazon's shown that it works. Most people are used to this kind of approach, particularly with Google or whatever. Some kind of free text search. Set up your database so that it will work with that and generate products. 
and, and I would recommend doing it this way rather than have like separate pages that you've kind of hand built for different categories. Just focus on a free text search and that's, that's all that's really required. So let's just show this how it works. Let's do bat batteries. It's really, you don't necessarily need a text suggestion, but you can if you want. So I've done a search for batteries, right? Um, it's put them in a specific category. And there we have a list of batteries, and I can like add them to basket and so forth. Look at them and add them to basket, right? And then um, I might even, can even try that. But what I want to show you first is um, we can do sorting here. So in the in the assessment criteria, um, one of the places you can get marks is by all, what's called ordering your products. And people get confused because there's double meaning of ordering, right? Ordering can mean like a place in order for something. But ordering can also mean sorting. So what I mean by ordering in that, in that piece of the part of the assessment is uh, sorting, right? So you need to implement some kind of sorting functionality. So I can do like low to high on the batteries, right? Um, or I can do, you know, so it's like low price to high price on the batteries. Or I can do, you know, high to low. I mean, don't worry about customer reviews. But so these are like really expensive batteries, I suppose. You know, very expensive batteries, eh? <laughs> um, so anyway, um, you can sort the batteries and sort the results um, based on their price or based on some other features, okay? So the things to focus on in your website are some kind of search facility and then some kind of sorting facility, okay? And then when we get to, this, get to, the, get to the thing, well, let's just, you know, pick something, right? If you look at it, then you can kind of add it to the, wherever the thing's gone. It's too expensive to add to the basket. Let's get on here. Uh, why can't I add it to my basket? Yeah, uh, oh. Let's try and pick something simple. Oh, there's nothing simple. Um, yeah, there we go. So click on add to basket, add it to the basket, and then there'll be a bunch of stuff for checking out and so on and so forth. And I'll have to sign in, which I'm not going to bother doing now. You get the idea, right? You've all done this. Okay, but you don't have to sell goods. You don't have to sell fish. You don't have to sell batteries. You can sell tickets, right? So here's another example. Less good website, but it's got you know lists of all the productions. There's probably some kind of search thing that half works on this. You click on book now, um, and for some reason it's taking another book now, and then you can kind of select your tickets. It's got some kind of flash thing for picking out, you know, which seat you want to sit and so on and so forth. So these are just some examples. Um, like I said, it doesn't really matter what you sell as long as you can implement the functionality correctly. Right, so in addition to that, what I've just shown you um, for Asda, Amazon, and the Hackney Empire, were the front ends, what the, cu what the customer's interacting with in order to buy the kind of goods and services and so on. And so companies also typically have um, what's called a content management system. And this is a separate website, also implemented in HTML, CSS, Java. I mean, you can, you can implement these in anything, right? You can implement them in JavaFX if you wanted. But in this case, you're going to implement it in uh, the same technology, Java, HTML, sorry, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's basically a separate website that lets the staff view, add, edit products, et cetera. And you have to have some kind of login for this so that you don't want the customers to be able to like, do stock management, right, or change the products. Because most staff members um, don't have the technical skills to deliberately to type in like SQL statements or no SQL statements. Um, but so you need some way in which non-technical staff can edit the database, and that's what a content management system does. So the customers never see it. So often, you know, unless there's some kind of high level of corporate pride, um, it often has a very kind of basic de design. So when I worked at uh, Trinity Mirror, there was like the glossy sort of front end sort of website, you know, showing all the news and that. And then they had a content management system um, that was much less beautiful, I can tell you, um, that let journalists kind of enter their stories and, you know, add other kinds of content to the database. So you, you've got to implement both of these, as I explained. So let's give a little demo. So I've done, implemented a very sort of basic one just to show you. Uh, let's go. So here's my kind of content management system. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. There's no marks for pretty content management systems. You can make it pretty if you like. And then you've got you know various functionality like home, add product, list products, edit product, delete product. So you can have a page for each of this or do it some different way. But if we go list products, for example, then I get a list of all the products in my database. You know, which is you know in this case cat magnets. That's what it's selling here. And then I can edit a particular product because this isn't very usable, but I can get like a product ID here. Uh, and I can uh, edit the product. So I bung the product ID in here. So this is not recommended you know, user, in, user interface stuff, but 
it works, right? So that I can specify product ID, and it'll pull up like some fields that let me change, you know, the name of the cat magnet, the description of it, and so on and so forth, and click save to save it. Um, and then I've also got the ability to kind of delete products by product ID if I want to. So this enables a non-technical member of staff to edit my database of cat magnets and therefore change the stock counts and so on if I had implemented that in, in this CMS, which I haven't. Right, so I think that's a fairly good idea um, about what I'm expecting you to implement. And I'm gonna go into details in the last section um, explaining how exact, exact details about what you need to implement and how many marks there are. But that's just the rough introductory overview of that. So now I wanna explain how the, how the actual project's gonna be run. So it's group work, okay? And the groups are allocated within the labs so that you can work together. So within each lab, there'll be several, several quite a few groups depending on the number of people. Um, so you'll all be able to work together during lab time. That's the idea. Now, the most important thing is these groups are not negotiable in any way, shape, or form, right? When you've been allocated into the group, you might hate every member of the group. They might, be, they might have, you know, I don't know, stolen your biscuits one day or something. I don't care. These groups are non-negotiable, all right? So don't come to us and complain about the personalities of group members um, because they're not going to change. And then there's a reason for that, as I'll explain. Right, so firstly, so the groups are going to be allocated at random. Uh, so that's why they're non-negotiable, because they're going to put you randomly um, into groups. And these are going to be uh, mixed ability groups, okay? So we're going to have some groups of two. So, so sorry, we're going to use the marks from coursework one from the first project um, to allocate you into groups uh, for coursework two. So, so groups of two will contain a person with a high mark for coursework one and a person with a medium mark for coursework one. So in this case, so it's sort of... Uh, someone who did really well at coursework one, and someone who did okay, you know, because in this case there's only two of you to work on it, so you know it's a high and a medium person. Now, if you've got a group of three, because you know the, with the numbers there'll be so, there's got to be some groups of two and some groups of three, unless it's divisible by three, number unless the number of students in the lab are divisible by three. So, we might, so we're going to have some groups of three. In this case, there'll be a person with a high mark for coursework one, a person with a medium mark for coursework one, and a person with a low mark for coursework one. So that's groups of two and groups of three. So we're going to get, get all the marks of course at one, and then I've got a bit of code that will put people into groups based on these criteria. Now, coursework two, um, there's, there's a section on the, group, on the course website, and there will be a list of the groups um, uh, on that website in early, early spring term. So here's the pitch. This is why I, I'm doing it this way. So, Firstly, mixability groups um, are fairer, right, in, in some ways. Um, so they enable people to make complementary contributions to learn from each other. So part of the motivation is this is going to be similar to a real work situation. So when you leave Middlesex, right, you're going to join some company and you're going to be shoved in a team and you're going to have to work with that team, all right? And when you go to work for Microsoft or whatever it is, uh, and you get put in a team, and the, your job is to maintain the back end uh, of the website, whatever it is, you're going to have to work with those bunch of people, and whether we, regardless of whether you like it or not. And the better you work with those people, um, the better you're going to do your job, and the more likely you are to succeed at your job, okay? It won't be, you know, when, when, when you go to work for Microsoft, if you say, oh, I don't like that guy, he, he stole my biscuits, or, you know, uh, he, he complains too much, or blah, 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 um, your boss will just ignore you. Okay, and say, work with these people, that's your job, that's what I'm paying for you for, that's what you've got to do. So mixed ability groups, or group work in general, is very similar to a uh, real work situation where you're put in a team and you have to work with that team regardless of whether you like or dislike particular team members. So this is a, a core life skill, all right? And it's also beneficial um, regardless of where you stand in, this, uh, in your marks, right? So obviously, if you've got a really low mark for coursework one, it's going to be beneficial working um, with people who've got higher medium marks, right? Um, because you're going to learn from the people that you're working with, and so it's going to be beneficial from you because you're going to get more skills. It's almost, you know, it's a way in which, you know, people can be inspired and uh, benefit from working with people who are better than them, right? That's obviously true. Um, and I've seen it a lot. In some of the groups that worked well last year, um, I certainly saw people with low and medium marks benefiting from working with people from high marks because they kind of gained from it. 
Now, people with high marks, people who are like really skilled at this stuff might say, oh, you know, why should I have to work with X and Y who got less marks than me and are obviously not as skilled as me, right? Well, firstly, um, these people are not as skilled as the people with high marks um, I can still make contrib different contributions. Just because you've got a low mark uh, for writing JavaScript doesn't mean that you're not any good at stuff. It just means maybe you've got a different set of skills from the person who got a high mark for writing JavaScript, let's say. So there might be, you know, someone got low mark might be great at databases. They might be great at, you know, writing project reports. They might be great at other stuff or designing the database or coming up with ideas, right? So it's not necessarily the case that just because you get a low mark at something that you're completely rubbish, right? Most times, that's not the case, right? Most times, someone's got a low mark in one set of it, one area, has you know, many other skills in another area. So the person here can say, well, hey-ho, I'm working with these people. Let's try, and, let's try and make it work so that we can all make, give something to the team. And so this person with the high mark is going to gain um, from you know, working together and getting the complementary contributions, right? So I saw several people who had good graphical skills, for example, but weren't necessarily particularly great at coding um, in the course last year. Now, another reason why this really doesn't harm anyone um, is that there's this contribution formula. So if the person with the high mark you know, turns out, let's suppose, hypothetically, um, that the person with the low mark here is actually just not very good at computer science. Let's say they just ended up on the course because their you know, father pressurized them to join or whatever. You know. But then that's going to benefit them as well. Because if this person does virtually no work or no work at all for, the, for this project, then the contribution formula will mean that this person will get a higher mark than they would have done without being in the team. Okay? Because this, the same project in which that's done by mostly by this person will mean that this person will get, actually get a higher mark, and I'll explain how that works. So this person's always going to gain, this person's always going to gain, and this person's always going to gain, and that's the nature of teams, right? That with teams, you're all working together, and you produce something that's bigger than, and better than each of the people could have done working alone. And I'm totally convinced, and I'm more than willing to discuss this in the Q&A session, that this, that this will be the case here. And most of the, most of the groups, um, when the first round of this course, um, benefited from working in the group. I think I had no hesitation or reservation saying that it was a, a good thing. And the, the opposite, um, if I didn't do random group allocation, um, then we'd have a situation in which People would work together with their mates, and then you go, you know, the people who are left outside the group, you know, feeling a bit left out, which I've never liked. Um, or um, you have people, you get a kind of grouping of the high-skilled people working together, and then a grouping of the low-skilled people working together, and then the low, often the low-skilled stuff is just a bit of a disaster, right? Because they're not enable, they're not capable of, they don't have an opportunity to give a different kind of contribution or make complementary contributions. They just sort of end up just being a bit lost. So. For all reasons, um, I found this works very well. And we're going to stick to it, and you're going to work with this team regardless of whether you like or dislike particular team members. So if you're not a team player, you know, you're going to lose marks. So I recommend you uh, work on your team skills. Finally, um, the other reason why random group allocation is a, a, a fine thing to do um, is that it's great interview material. So in a year's time, um, you're going to be applying for jobs, and you're going to be hauled up in front of you know interview panel or whatever, um, in fact, even before you get to that interview panel, you're going to have to fill in some long and annoying application form, probably. And one of the things I guarantee you they will ask you is your ability to work in a team. Okay? So this is perfect interview material. You can say, well, in, you know, in the second year at computer science, I, I was put into a random group, and you know, we worked together, and we had some highs, and we had some lows, and, we had some, and I did some coordination, blah, blah, blah. You can tell a long story about how you worked with this team that you were randomly allocated in, which is very similar to real work situation. Great interview material. And again, when you're in front of that panel of inter the interview panel, and you know, they ask you, well, you know, David, how do you, how do you how, tell me about uh, your team experience working as a team, okay? So again, you can say, well, hey, you know, in CSD 2550, whatever module you're on, um, I was allocated into this team, and, you know, uh, Rudy, you know, was, was struggling, but I gave her some help, and then Rudy wrote some great stuff on the security, privacy, legal issues, or whatever, and so together we collectively built this amazing website, and here's an example, here's the URL or whatever. That's a good story you can tell, and you can even tell bad stories as long as they look you know, make yourself look good, right? So it's great interview material and has many other benefits. Right, so a couple of things that you mentioned more sort of related to the assessment. Um, so, many students um, have difficult personal problems that often interfere with their studies. So, 
you might be in a situation where you have like you're seriously ill, for example, or maybe a family member's died, or you know, you've got very difficult maybe childcare issues, something like that. So often people have, as they're studying, you know, it happens, um, you have difficult personal problems that are interfering with your studies. Um, now I'm going to talk about what deferred assessment is a little later, but the key thing about deferred, deferred students is that they, um, uh, they work, they, you can have a deferral, which means you get extra time to complete coursework without a marked penalty. And so deferred students are typically working to a different timetable from other students. So deferred students, if for some reason you get deferred, I'm not penalizing you in any way, but I can't really include you in the same, in the groups, uh, in a group with other students who are working to a different timetable. That's the important thing here, okay? Because maybe a deferred student will have an def uh, extension until May, let's say, or an extension until August to complete their coursework. So obviously, that's not, they're not, not going to be able to work in a group with people who have a deadline in April, for example. So it's not, I'm not trying to victimize or persecute deferred students. I'm just not going to include them in the random groups because of this timetable issue. So deferred students, if you find yourself in the position of being a deferred student, you're going to have to complete course at one. Individual project, same as everyone else, on a timetable that we will agree. And then there'll be an individual version of coursework two. So with most people will be allocated into these random groups, but people who are not on the same timetable can't work together in a group with people. You can't work together in, in the same group with people who have different deadlines, right? So you just have to do an individual course version of coursework two, which is a bit easier, okay? So I've taken out some of the hard bits, made it a bit easier so that individual person can complete it on their own. And there'll be a deadline in early May from that. So basically, if you end up in the position of being a deferred student, we'll talk to, talk to me or your module leader about this, and we'll sort it out and give you an individual version of coursework too. Now, in the first year I ran this course, there were a number of non-submitting students. Didn't turn up to much, didn't do any work, couldn't be bothered to finish coursework one and submit it. Um, and that's what I mean by a non-submitting student. So coursework one is developing skills that are required to tackle coursework two, okay? You can't really tackle coursework two or make a contribution to coursework two if you haven't learned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? Because that's the whole front end of the website's based on that. So if you don't submit coursework one, I'm not gonna put you in the random groups either. Instead, you have a chance to resubmit coursework one by the end of week 23, but obviously you need to get 40% overall. In fact, in this case, it's, uh, it's more than 80% um, because this is only worth, is it 80%? Uh, no, you need to get 40% overall, so you, you probably need to get something higher than that, right? We have to tackle coursework, um, coursework uh, three at the same time or something like that, so it's, it's actually more than 80%. So again, we'll talk individually about this, but if you can't be bothered to do coursework one, uh, I'm not going to include you in a group with other people who are more committed to the course. So, support for coursework two. So, we've got peer support within groups. That's part of the reason we've got groups, right? And then there'll be laboratory sessions on PHP, MongoDB, Ajax, bunches, bunch of lectures, recorded lectures. There'll be some uh, laboratory sessions dedicated to the coursework. Q&A sessions where I can answer questions and, and maybe go through some code if you need it. But as usual, there's only 22 hours of labs in the spring term, okay? So you can't expect to do all of, all of the e-commerce website within those 22 hours, as well as learning technology at the same time. You're gonna have to work on this coursework in your own time, okay? No doubt about that in my mind. But if you wanna succeed in this coursework, you're gonna have to spend your own time on it. And in fact, there's only three hours, two to three hours per week of contact time, right? You're expected to do another four or five hours of your own work, you know, independently of the actual, you know, face-to-face uh, -face teaching. So submission, of work, submission um, will be all through links on the course website. Now, in the unlikely event um, that the submission links are not working, I mean, it happens, um, then email by email your submission to the module leader. If you have to email it, I hope you don't, but if you have to, try and strip out all the real heavy stuff, okay? So don't include a dump of the MongoDB database. Don't include, like, massive videos if you've got them. Try and make it compact, like less than 10 megabytes, ideally. And then on the course website, you'll see a submission link for the first submission and link for this final submission. So only one member of your team needs to submit it. Um, we'll obviously find out, you know, we know who's, who's in what team, who's in which group, group, so we can obviously find, you know, find the appropriate submission. So two submission stages. First submission um, is worth 20% of the mark, and we'll have the database design, the front end of the website, progress report, and the contribution spreadsheet. And at the end of week 16, as I said, the exact dates are given in the project description. And then the final submission, 80% of the mark, will have the final report, the code, and the contribution spreadsheet, end of week 23. And then we're actually going to do a demonstration of your projects in the labs in week 24. 
Now, I mentioned this deferral of assessment before. Um, so, as I said, many students have personal problems, uh, illness, illness of a family member, uh, you know, bereavement, all this kind of stuff. Um, Middlesex is, you know, will do its best um, to accommodate you if you're in this kind of situation. It's never, very pl never pleasant to be in these kind of situations. So what you can do is apply for a deferral of assessment that gives you extra time to complete coursework, and you can also retake exams without a mark penalty. So first year did this course, you know, maybe five or six, maybe more, actually, maybe almost 10 students, I think, had, went through the deferral of assessment mechanism, and most of them passed the course successfully. They just needed a bit of extra time because of all these personal problems that they had going on. Now, if you do, if you want to apply for deferral of assessment, don't come to me and tell me all about it because I'm not qualified to assess, you know, um, whether what you're saying to me is true or not. Instead, you have to provide documentary evidence to people who are, you know, who are uh, trained to assess this documentary evidence and all the details are there. So you basically, there's a sort of form you have to fill in. You have to submit your documentary evidence. They assess it and then they update your student record um, to mark the fact that you've got a deferral of assessment and they mark, record the fact about when your, uh, deadline, your deadlines have been shifted through. So if you apply in sort of, uh, January, let's say, you probably get deferral of assessment till May or if you apply in April, you probably get deferral of assessment till August. As I said, there's no mark penalty. This is there to help people who are struggling for, pers for serious personal reasons. And as long as you provide documentary evidence, then it's all fine. And you know, talk to me or your module leader if you want to know more about this or need any help with that, okay? However, if you haven't got a deferral assessment, um, then uh, I'm very unlikely to give an extension to coursework. Uh, one thing about the deferral assessment is you must tell your module leader um, if you've been granted a deferral of assessment. Unfortunately, there's no mechanism um, whereby the people who grant the deferral of assessment tell the module leaders. Don't ask me why, but that's the case. So please tell your module leader, otherwise they'll think that you just haven't submitted something and um, you know, maybe you, know, you get your mark wrong for it, which wouldn't be a good thing. So please tell your module leader, discuss it with your module leader, but you actually have to go through the formal process to actually get the deferral of assessment. However, yeah, if you haven't got a deferral of assessment, um, then I'm very unlikely to give extensions to coursework. Very unlikely to accept excuses, okay? We've got the deferral assessment mechanism for people who have real, genuine excuses, and so coming to me and saying, oh, I lost my USB stick, um, therefore, you know, we, we lost our entire project. Well, you know, come on, you know, you're second year computer science students, you can learn, you can back your stuff up. So losing USB sticks, couldn't care less, just give you no marks, okay? You have to take responsibility for uh, backing up your data, and if you don't do that, then you know, you've got to learn the hard way, and the hard way is you're going to get no marks. Again, if you say, well, I'm moving house this week, I split up with my girlfriend, you know, I saw a sad program on television, all of these things, the lousy excuses, right, or I forgot, you know, come on, you know, you, you've got to you know, step up to the mark, whatever it is, right? Not going to accept these kind of excuses, right? So I strongly recommend you hand your coursework in on time. Take it seriously, do it properly, hand it in on time, and you get the marks for it. Otherwise, you're going to lose the marks. Contact the module leader, such as myself, if it's CSD 2550. If you run into problems, happy to have a conversation with, it, with you about it, but very unlikely to give an extension. So don't place any great hopes on that. So unless the module leader's given you permission for latest mission, um, the marks available for coursework will halve every 24 hours after the deadline and will be zero after one week. So you have like a little bit of a window 24 hours after the deadline to hand something in, you know, but after that, the mark will halve. At 24 hours later, it will halve again and again. After a week, you'll get nothing for it. And that will be adhered to strictly. So I recommend you plan your work, get it ahead, done ahead of time, submit it a little early even, right? So plagiarism, serious academic offense. Um, I'm sure you've been lectured on that before. Students that submit identical projects um, will be reported to the university. If you're found guilty, you have to resubmit your work, your marks could be capped, you could be failed the module, could be kicked off the course in the worst case, okay? More information here, just don't do it. And this also applies, this, is, this applies to copying your peers, but it also applies to copying stuff online, okay? If you just copy something offline, off the internet, and hand it in as your own work, you'll get no marks for it, and we'll check, and it will be obvious. However, I recognize this, this, this plagiarism is not really a black and white issue, right? It's like there's often a blurry line uh, between copy and collaboration. People work together, help each other solve problems, and apply the solutions to their projects. This is all great, right? I'm all for collaboration. You're working together in the labs, you're working together as a group. 
collaborate, that's absolutely fine. What's not fine is to collaborate on a single project and make a couple of minor changes to that project and then submit the two projects as two separate pieces of work. Okay? That's not acceptable. So if you produce a single website and then you call one, you know, my happy website and the other one my cheery website, right? And the data in the website's almost identical and all the code's almost identical, then that's too much collaboration, okay? So if you get two projects like that, and let's suppose it gets a mark of 60% and it's been handed in by three groups, then I'm gonna divide the mark between the projects, between the groups, sorry. So instead of getting 60%, um, each group's going to get 20%. Because all they've done is basically pooled, they've, instead of having uh, three people working on the website, they've effectively had nine people working on the same website and handed in you know, near clones of it um, independently. And it only applies to the marks of the parts of the project that are identical. Now, the thing with um, all kinds of plagiarism is, I'm not, you know, we're not going to police this in detail, okay? We're not going to do detailed, you know, tracing of files and logs and so on to find out who copied who or who collaborated with who. If two, if three projects look, it'll be very clear if they look this identical, we're just going to mark them down by, divide them up between the groups. Or if, you know, there's uh, someone's copied your project but you weren't aware of it, um, then you're all going to be handed, to, you know, uh, punished for plagiarism, right? We're not going to get, like, somehow check um, to see who copied who. If two projects are completely identical, um, then, you know, you're both going to be punished. So take care that you don't give your project off to other people. Make sure you don't just leave it on the lab machines. Make sure you don't lose your USB stick. If you're going to use USB sticks, that's fine. Just don't lose them or encrypt them um, if you want to be careful about that. But in general, you know, you're responsible for this, not us. Right. So let's go through these submissions. So the first submission is worth 20% of the mark. You need to submit the code for the front end of the website, the progress report, and a spreadsheet describing the contributions that each person's made to the project. Now, this database design, you're going to have to submit as part of the first submission. It can be included in the report, um, or it can be as separate files that are zipped up with the code. And the deadline is the end of week 16. So database design, in uh, I think the second lecture on MongoDB, I kind of explain in detail what I mean by that. Um, so don't worry about if you don't understand what a MongoDB database design is, but you need to hand it in and as, as part of the first submission. It's worth 4%. 4 you need to list the collections, give examples of documents in each collection. So, you might, so you're saying, well, I'm going to have a, my database is structured. You know, I've got like a collection of customers, collection of products, collection of orders, and here's some examples of what a customer document looks like, an order document looks like, and a uh, product data, uh, document looks like. Ideally, your database design should capture all the data that's going to be required by the website. Um, so, yeah, as you can include it as separate files or actually dump screenshots into your project report. You're welcome to change this later, but I want you to design the database um, by week, week 16. That's the idea. Now, the front end of the website, you're also going to submit in week 16. Um, it's going to be marked for attractiveness and usability. Um, it's going to be marked for code quality. And so I want you to submit the code for the website and include screenshots in the, pro in the progress report. Now, there's no marks for the front end after the first submission. So there's no point in spending lots of time you know, making it look even prettier, even more beautiful, even more slick um, between week 16 and week 23 because there's no extra marks for it. You're welcome to spend as much time as you want making it look pretty, but just be aware that you might be better off focusing on the back end functionality where the actual marks are going to be between week 17 and week 23. So, um, when you, for the first submission, just zip up all the files that are required to make the front end of your website run. So, PHP files, CSS files, JavaScript files, images, and third-party libraries. I, we don't need, like, NetBeans project files, bracket project files, and so on and so forth. Um, we just want the, the stuff that you would be deploying on a server if you're going to make this front-end website of the website live. Your first submission is also going to include a project progress report. I want you to briefly describe, describe the project, you know, what's the website, what's it selling, so on and so forth. How, how, how's it going, right? What have you built? How, have you made progress with the back end as well as the front end, so on and so forth? You must say which third-party libraries are being used in the project or state that those third-party libraries are, uh, are used. You'll lose marks if you don't accurately list your third-party libraries. There'll be a spreadsheet with the contributions group members, um, so that actually won't be in the progress report. Um, and then screenshots of all the website pages. 
so that we can mark it without actually necessarily running it. And as I said, the database designed for the MongoDB. Don't please include screen, please don't include screenshots of your code in your project report. I don't need to see the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, you know, attractive screenshots of the command line. Who cares, right? Because we've got the screenshots of the screenshot of the website pages and we've got the code anyway. So we don't need screenshots of code in the report. And anything you put into your report, progress report can also be included in the final report. Now your first submission uh, must include a copy of the spreadsheet. Um, this is the name of the file, contribution formula, first submission. You can download it from the course website here. And you must agree the contributions in the spreadsheet by all group members. This is going to be used to allocate your final mark for the first submission um, and for the final submission. So make sure that you agree on it. Okay? It's not fair for one, one group member to fill in the spreadsheet and submit it um, without consulting the other group members. And certainly in the final demonstration, we're going to check that you're all happy with this. Okay? So I'm going to explain what this is. So, this is how we convert the mark for the project into an individual mark. All right? So there's two of these, one for the first submission, one for the final submission. And this means, and I'll explain, uh, probably, probably easiest explaining it. Yeah, let's just see what I got. Yeah, okay. So, so I'll, go, I'll, I'll show you the spreadsheet itself, but let's just roughly explain it here. So here we have the three names, names of the three students who are in this, in this group, right? And then, so you enter Alice, Bob, and Carol. Then these are the marks, of, these are the different sort of features um, in the first submission. So we've got the progress report, the database design, the front end, the code quality, um, and that's it. And these are the marks that are available for each of these features. Now, uh, your lab teacher or module leader or whatever will mark your first submission and award you some marks for each of these features up to the maximum here. Now here, we have the contribution that each of, each of the group members has made um, to this submission. And the numbers in each of these rows here must add up to, um, add up to one, okay? So, you know, if Alice did the work on the progress report, she put a one here, naught, naught. Maybe Carol, maybe Carol and Bob con collaborated on the front end of the website, so that should be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, naught. And the contribution check here will say, okay, um, if the numbers add up to one, it will say error if the numbers do not add up to one, and it'll say um, not implemented if they add up to zero. So what you get here, it's basically does a pairwise multiplication between the, the, each of the numbers here and the numbers here. So it'll multiply, suppose they got six the progress report and Alice did it, it'll multiply six by one, and this is the total number of marks that Alice, Bob, and Carol contributed to the project. And what it does, to, and so these are the, the marks that each of the people has contributed to the project. And then what we do is put those marks through this contribution formula. So I'm not going to like go into massive detail, but you basically have a small bit of maths that uh, takes the average mark um, that person, that's been contributed to the project. And people who contribute more than average have their mark boosted a bit, up to 33%. And people who contribute less than average have their mark cut by up to 33%. So it just goes into that formula there. So, so the, you can't get boosted beyond the maximum marks that are available. And um, the maximum, there's a factor of 33, which means that you can only get your mark boosted by up to 33% or cut by up to 33%. And most importantly, um, if someone's made zero contribution, then they will just get zero marks. Okay, So make sure um, that everybody, if, when you're planning out the work, make sure everyone gets a chance to contribute something. Because otherwise, if this number's zero, Carol will just get zero, okay? And, and then she's likely to fail the project. So Carol, if I was Carol, and maybe, you know, maybe I wasn't, you know, particularly keen on the technology side, then you could still do the pro progress report and, you know, get, make some contribution there, for example. Or maybe Bob, you know, can't stand writing HTML and CSS, but maybe, so maybe Bob could do the database design. So when you're planning out the work for your projects, start with thinking about how each person can make some contribution, otherwise you're just going to get no marks. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Right, so I think the easiest way to do this is show you a demo. So let's have a little demo. So this is, that's the final submission one. Let's uh, find this wretched thing. Uh, come on.
first submission. Right, there we go. Okay, so another point to note is I've locked this spreadsheet because people made some mistakes editing it last year. So all the fields, apart from the ones that you are supposed to make entries on, should be locked. So if I try and enter, if I try and change, you know, this, the percentage mark change, for example, you get this error saying the cell blah, blah, blah is locked and therefore read only. So it's just to protect you against yourselves, kind of. Thing. So let's say we've got three people in this, in this group. We'll call, you know, John, you know, Barry, Susan. All right, so we enter our names here, okay? And for this, this um, so one thing I haven't pointed out, actually, we've got group size three and group size two. So if you're group size two, you use this, this worksheet here with only two names. And if you've got group size of three, use this worksheet here with three names. So we enter our three names. And you can see here we've got John, Barry, and Susan. Now, we don't really know how many marks. This, so then let's suppose I mark the project, all right? So I give that four. Uh, this is our four, that's three. Let's get five and two and two, right? So I've marked, so someone's marked the project. That's, so they're going to enter the marks here. And so there's 16 marks that have been given to the project. Now let's suppose John uh, did the work on the progress reports. Uh, Barry did the work on the MongoDB. Um, and, you know, let's, let's see, Carol did, let's say uh, Carol contributed on the... So you can see here, because the numbers here should all add up to one, we've got an error here. This is okay, because it adds up one. And no one's done any work on here, so let's say not implemented. So we need to fix the error column, all right? So let's say John and Barry uh, contributed, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay, well, that's, that's kind of all right, yeah. Right, so, so they're all okay or not implemented. Um, let's, just, let's just give, uh, uh, let's say John did that as well, yeah? So John's done, you know, Generally, the higher the mark, the more effort required, right? So John has contributed, in this case, 10 marks to the project. Barry's contributed four marks to the project, and Susan contributed two marks to the project. So now if we look down here, we've got the average contribution, which is the average of these three numbers here, which is like 5.33333, whatever. And what it's going to do is it's going to bung it into that formula I showed you, and it's going to increase the mark for people who are above that average and cut the mark for people who are below that average up to a maximum of 33%. So the final mark is 16, okay? So John marks, John's mark gets boosted up to 21, which is flat, which is the maximum mark is 20, so that's going to be cut to 20. So, so John's mark's been boosted because he's did the most work on the project. And then we've got Barry's mark is 15, because if you look at Barry, he's done four, so it should be cut maybe a little bit, um, but because it's uh, sort of close enough and with all the rounding or whatever, it ends up being the same. And then Susan's marks below average, so she gets her mark cut, and in this case cut down by a couple of marks to 13. Now let's suppose um, Susan did no work, um, never mind about the error. In this case, because she did no work, she doesn't get boosted or cut, she just gets set to a flat zero. So this shows you that, you know, this, this contribution formula tries to take into account the fact that people, you know, uh, do different amounts of work. So again, if we do, uh, if we cut Barry's even more, then, yeah, Barry's is still being cut, right? Because it's, in this case, it's been cut because it's three, and the average now is four. In this case, it's been cut a little bit from 16. So all you have to do is fill in this pink stuff here, and the spreadsheet will do the rest for you. Okay. So not all groups, or people for that matter, are perfect, right? Often there'll be kind of disputes, issues, and so on and so forth. So some groups may experience problems with limited participation of some of their members. I'm not saying that that will never happen. It will happen sometimes. I hope it doesn't. So the first thing to try is to you know, talk to each other, right? You've got a common goal of producing a project that gets a high number of marks so that you all do well, okay? And you learn the technology and so on and so forth. So you've kind of got a common, there's a lot to be gained by setting aside petty differences, okay? Because you're gonna benefit if you all work together. So first thing I recommend is talk to each other. If that doesn't work or you've got some problems, um, go and see your lab teacher, okay? Because your lab teacher will know your work better than, anyone, better than I will, for example. Um, so talk to your lab teacher and try and get your lab teacher to sort, sort out the problems and you know, mediate the disputes between you. If that doesn't work, go and see your module leader. So if, if the group's having problems and the lab teacher can't sort it out, if in my module, I'm more than happy to sort of see the groups 
and, and discuss it and try and resolve the difficulties that they're having. Try and allocate bits of work to different people, reach some kind of agreement. Sometimes a group finds it helpful to have a third party who's more neutral to kind of help sort out the problems. In general, if you're hitting these kind of problems, keep a record of project meetings, date, time, emails, and who attended. Set up doodle polls. Do your best to include members who aren't turning up to meetings. But if you do everything possible to include them, and then they, don't just, and they just don't show up, then you're fine to give them a zero contribution. Um, but you need, if you're going to mark people down for not turning up to meetings, that's fine. But if you don't invite them to meetings, that's not fine at all. Okay? You've obviously got to make the best effort to include them. Then you can justify saying, well, look, you know, Barry you know, didn't turn up to any of the meetings. Here's the emails inviting Barry. Here's Barry saying, I'm too busy. I'm washing my hair and so on and so forth. Um, in that case, you can say, well, Barry deserves nothing. And we can prove that we've tried to include Barry as much as possible. It's certainly not OK to form a little clique within your group, do all the work, and then claim that someone who's been, actually been excluded um, you know, didn't make any contribution. You know, that will be uh, viewed in a very negative light, shall I say. So please contact your lab, lab teacher having problems with group dynamics. Best to sort it out. If you are having problems, document what you're doing and do your very best to include people who are not necessarily, gonna, not necessarily turning up. OK, final submission then. 80% of the mark. Um, you need to submit a final report, all the code, and a contribution spreadsheet. And I'll go through the, all of this. Again, deadline ended at week 23. So final report. You're going to briefly describe the project. Uh, sorry, exclude that. Uh, the contribution group member being a separate spreadsheet. List the third party libraries. And importantly, you're going to describe the security, privacy, and legal issues um, that affect the website. So there'll be a lecture uh, later in the term going into all the security, privacy, legal issues, um, and I'll explain roughly you know, what I'm expecting you to do with that. And I want you to list, uh, I want you to describe the security, privacy, legal issues, and list the steps that have been taken to address these issues, and suggest that unresolved issues could be uh, addressed in the future. So I'm not expecting your website to be coming on a bulletproof, you know, hyper-secure, you know, hyper-private, conformant to all legal regulations, and so on, and the rest of it. I'm expecting you to think about how it might become that, and figure out how you can actually figure, uh, address that in the future. In your, project, in your final report, please don't include screenshots of code, OK? Um, you know, no shots of net beans, command lines, so on and so forth. It's not relevant. We've got your code anyway. So the code, I want you to zip up all the files required to make your website run. You can include a dump of MongoDB, but don't, you don't have to, right? And don't bother trying to copy the, the MongoDB file. It's kind of 300 megabytes, and it's going to be a massive submission for you. So I'm not expecting you to submit the database. Really, just submit the code that's required to make your website run. So the PHP files, CSS, JavaScript files, images. Maybe if you've written some scripts to set up your database, you could include those. Um, and maybe if you've got some specialized third-party library that for, the third, for the front end that isn't available on a content delivery network, maybe you can include that. It's not necessary to include project files and NetBeans. So NetBeans all kind of messy, annoying project files. Don't need to include any of those. So, uh, sorry, the final submission, that should say here, a few errors in these slides, should include a copy of the spreadsheet contribution formula final submission. And you must agree the contributions in the spreadsheet by all group members. As I said, it's not fair just to put Barry down for nothing when Barry didn't have a chance or Barry tried, but, you know, whatever. So please try and agree on these contributions between yourselves. Um, and then you can download the contributions, the final submission uh, contribution spreadsheet there. So it looks like this. Works in the same way as the uh, first submission. So again, you put your name. So we've got versions for two groups and groups of two and groups of three. This is the groups of three version. You put your names there. You um, put, you know, enter the values here uh, it, so that the, each row adds up to one. Again, here are each of the features um, and the marks available for those features. And it works exactly the same way as the first contribution spreadsheet. You just put in the mark, put in the contributions, and it will calculate you know, um, per the person's final mark based upon their contribution to the project. So I'll give you a little demo on this too, uh, just to make sure it's all very clear. That's the first, that's the first one. Final submission, right, OK. So here we've got Alice, Bob, and Carol. So uh, I'm not feeling very imaginative today. Susan, Jake, and Barry. You know, Barry's still there, right? So, you know, let's, let's just copy some of these marks, right? Might work. Yeah, okay, so let's suppose they did that, that kind of stuff in the project. So 
do these marks. This is the total number of marks that the project as a whole is awarded. And then, you know, we can work through here. So Susan did a lot, let's say. Well, not 11, that's generating an error, right? Uh, and then we can do, you know, one here and one here, let's say. Righty-ho, so, uh, so here, obviously, Susan's done a lot. She worked hard on all these bits and bobs. Um, Jake has done a little bit, and Barry's done a little bit too. But they haven't done a lot, so that's kind of a slightly lousy project, and you're getting 40 marks for that. So that's the, that's the amount of marks that each person's generated for the project. Then we take the average contribution, which is in this case 10. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and then we weight the marks. Um, we sort of boost Susan's mark because she's done more than average. Um, Jake has done less than average, so she'd have it cut. Yeah, that's right. And Barry has done slightly less than average, so also having it cut. So in this case, you can see the project gets a mark of 40, but Susan gets a mark of 57 because she's really worked hard to, to even, you know, she's made a massive contribution to that 40 marks. Whereas Jake and Barry have been a bit slack, um, so they've had their mark cut from 40 um, to about 30, 31, 32. So it's only 33%, but, and obviously if uh, Jake and Barry did nothing, um, then they get no marks, and Susan would get even more marks. So, you know, Susan had to do the project by herself, let's say. Um, uh, then she's still doing the 23 marks, but then you can see she's boosting up to 66 marks out of 80. Um, because she's actually basically done all that stuff by herself. So I think that's kind of fair, right? That Susan has had to do a three-person job, you know, by herself. In that case, she gets not just 40, but she gets more because it's a, she's been going beyond the call of duty, so to speak. Whereas Jake and Barry get nothing because they just slacked off and, you know, they're going to fail the module, basically. So make your choices, right? Right, assessment. So to assess your projects, um, we're going to read the reports, going to read the code, and we're going to view a short demonstration of your website during laboratory sessions after the submission date. We'll mark the project out of 100. Um, and then, as I explained, we're going to use these contribution spreadsheets to scale the mark of the group members up or down, depending on whether they made above average contributions or below average contributions to the project. And one thing I'd like to say, actually, is um, if you're filling this in, some groups work fantastically together, right? So in that case, you can just have 0.33, 0.33, 0.33, you can give yourselves all the same mark and then you all get the same mark for the project. You don't have to, you know, pick and choose here. If you feel that everyone's made a really good contribution, um, then you can just all opt to have the same mark. Um, so we'll get the, we'll assign individual marks using the contribution spreadsheet and then we'll scale that down to a mark between 0 and 30 corresponds to 30% for the overall mark for the module. So, ba, 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 ba. so we're going to mark the front end, uh, the progress report, and the database design after the first submission. You can change this stuff, but you can't change the marks that you got for this stuff, okay? If you come up with a new radical wild database design in week 17, great, um, but you're not going to get any extra marks for it. And then we're going to mark the rest of the project after the final submission date. Now, a core part of the marking of the project is a demonstration, okay? You must uh, demonstrate your project to us um, during laboratory sessions after the final submission date. So there'll be a week 24 laboratory session, and we're expecting you to demonstrate your project then. First thing to note, you have to demonstrate the submitted code. There's no point in working on an improved version over the weekend after the submission date. We're going to mark the submitted version. And, you know, we will aim to mark most projects in the week 24 laboratory session because everybody's around then. But if for some reason, you know, your team members are sick or something like that, then you can demonstrate it to us a little later, but it must be demonstrated. We'll set a deadline in early May. If it's not demonstrated by then, you'll get no marks for it. End of story. If you're not present at the demonstration, you lose your right to dispute the contributions that have been given to you by the group members, okay? You can't be bothered to turn up to the demonstration uh, and dispute the marks in the contribution formula. Um, then you're just going to have to accept them, okay? Um, you're not going to get a mark unless you demonstrate your project. The demonstration has several purposes, right? It's so we can see your project up and running. We don't have time, motivation, technology, whatever, um, to run every single one of your projects, setting up the database, and we don't even have the database files for your projects, okay? I'm not asking you to submit the database files, so it's actually practically impossible for us to run your projects, you know, without writing, uh, building a new database from scratch, okay? So we have to show your project to us running um, because we're not going to be able to run it ourselves. That's one reason. Second reason is, for this demonstration, is we want to discuss 
how the project dynamics went, resolve any final disputes, make sure that everybody in the group has agreed on the contributions that, they have, that are listed in the contribution spreadsheet. So I want to re be sure that everyone's comfort, you know, is, is happy with the contributions, and we want to see the website running. And finally, this is the opportunity for us to give you verbal feedback about your projects, to explain, well, you know, say, well, this is great, well done, or maybe you could have done this, or maybe you could have done that, and so on and so forth. So this chance, you know, for us to communicate with you about your project and maybe talk about how it could be improved in the future. So it's really important, this demonstration, and that's why, I'm, um, make, that's why there's a requirement that you demonstrate and you get no marks if you don't demonstrate. So um, your project will be marked using the assessment criteria, which is in the coursework description. As with all of the coursework um, in the courses that I teach, I have very you know, detailed assessment criteria, and I strongly recommend you read these through carefully, and I strongly recommend that you um, use these criteria yourselves to mark your project. So you can see, well, hey, you know, I hadn't noticed that code quality thing before. You know, maybe we should improve the code quality so we can get a better mark. A lot of these things are really easy to do, but if you don't notice them and don't notice how many marks are available for them, then um, you know, you're going to lose marks for no reason. So I strongly recommend you have a look at this document here in the Coursework 2 section of the course website. That has all the submission dates for each year, and it'll have all the assessment criteria as well. So this is what the assessment criteria looks like. I'm going to go through this in a little bit in detail now. So firstly, on the date thing, so the, the, the document that you'll download from the course website each year will have the exact submission times and dates um, listed in the assessment criteria, okay? Here, for this lecture, I've kind of put over the, the, the weeks within which these dates fall on the year when I'm recording the lecture, okay? So in this case, it's week 16 is, is that particular date there. So all of this stuff is uh, week 16. So first, we have the progress report. As I explained, short description of the website um, not, doesn't include contribution group members, so there's a slight mistake there, and listing the third party libraries. So you're getting marks um, for describing the design, the features of the front. This is like in words or whatever, describing the features of the website, getting two marks for doing screenshots of all the pages in the website, and two marks for including the first the contribution spreadsheet. Then we've got the database design, as I said, explain exactly what I'm expecting you to submit in a later lecture. But basically, you've got to list the collections, give examples of documents within each collection. Um, and you know, you'll be marked on whether the database captures the data that's going to be required by the website. So if it's a competent database design, you, know, you can get the full marks there. Then you're going to submit the front end of the website, the code for that, as well as the front end for the, of the content management system. And we're going to make some giving you marks based upon attractiveness and usability. So obviously, if it's an easy to use website and content management system, um, then you're going to get the five marks, as, long as, you know, as well as the marks of attractiveness, obviously. So we're going to make a you know, rough judgment on how, easy, how good it looks and how easy it is to use. And then code quality. As with all the assignments that I give, um, there's marks for layout, organization comments. It'll help you build better websites. It'll help um, uh, you know, other other people to maintain them. So this is HTML code quality in this case. Um, so if your HTML is all being generated by PHP, you won't lose any marks for that. We'll give you marks for the HTML that we can see in your website. So that's the, this is all part of the first submission. And then the final submission, um, we've got all these different bits of functionality. As I said, all this functionality must be implemented with PHP and MongoDB. So this is all the Amazon stuff, right? We can kind of add products to a basket. When you check out, the purchase is recorded and confirmation displayed. No marks for a confirmation email, no marks for taking money from the customer, and the product data is going to be stored on the server. So you're getting five marks for implementing the basket and five marks for checkout and confirmation. Then we've got search. As I said, again, think about Amazon. You're typing stuff into a search box, clicking search, and it's returning products that match the search. Don't bother organizing your website into separate pages where you've hand-coded different types of products. Just focus on the search in terms of enabling customers to find products. So customers can search your products. It'll return a bunch of results, depending on what you type, like batteries, whatever. And then the results can be ordered. And what I mean is sorted, like uh, sort prices, sort products from high to low price, low to high product price, uh, relevance, and so on and so forth. Um, and number of products in stock is displayed in the search results. So there's five marks for the search functionality and five marks for ordering. And what I mean by ordering here is sorting the products uh, by price, relevance, category, etc. 
There's a registration functionality, so the customers should be able to register on the website. So think of, you can sort of use similar ideas to what we were talking about uh, in the first piece of coursework with the registration game website. So customers should be able to register, except in this case, the customer's details are going to be stored server side. And the customer should be able to view past orders and all the customer data is stored on the server. So there's like three marks for storing customer details, three marks for enabling the customers to edit their details, and four marks for viewing past orders um, on the website. Then we've got customer tracking recommendation. There's going to be a separate lecture explaining how you can do that or making some suggestions how you can do that. So when you check out or just when the customer's browsing, you can make suggestions about what the customer should, um, might want to buy next. So these recommendations should, should not be based on the season. Okay? This, is, this is recommendations based on browsing or purchase data. So it, just because it's Christmas, it's not no good to just, I don't want Christmas recommendations, Easter recommendations, Valentine's recommendations, none of that, right? I want recommendations based on what the customer's been eyeballing on the website or maybe based on their purchase history. Um, that's a little bit more dubious because obviously if they bought something, they're not very likely to buy it again unless you've got some kind of sophisticated data model. More likely, if the customer's been looking at something maybe last week, then they might be persuaded to buy it if they haven't bought it already. So you want to use the customer's browsing or shopping data um, to generate the recommendations. And so we've got separate marks for the tracking. So if you can't get the recommendation working, but if at least you get the tracking working, then you can get some marks for that. And if you use that tracking data to generate recommendations, you can get another five marks for that. Then we've got the CMS, CMS, the content management system. This enables staff to log into the site, and then they can view and edit products and customer orders and so on and so forth. So if you remember, you know, I gave you a little demo of that, you know, this kind of stuff, that's, what, that's this content management system. That's what these marks are for there. Uh, So there's two marks for logging in, viewing products, two marks for viewing, two marks for adding, two marks for editing, two marks for managing customer orders. So you implement each of these bits of functionality and then you get the marks for that. Then we've got Ajax communication between client and server. This is where we're using JavaScript to talk directly to the server uh, without reloading the page. So again, I'm going to give you some lectures on that to explain what Ajax is all about. Um, I don't really mind how you use Ajax. Um, so but there's, different, there's some marks for sort of simple Ajax and some marks for sophisticated Ajax. I'm not specifying how you should use it, but it's just saying how complicated the use could be. So if you, by simple, um, you know, you could just have a bit of JavaScript um, that pings the server for the date, for example, or for some simple bit of data, and then insert that data into the website, and you can get your four marks for simple use of Ajax. Pinging the server for a simple bit of data, putting that data into the website, um, you can get your four marks there. If you sophisticated use of Ajax, um, would be more like using the Ajax for a customer login, for example, or, you know, or for actual implementing maybe the search or recommendation or whatever, or communicating dynamically with the server. So if you're running a good website, you're going to be using Ajax a lot, and it's good practice for the third piece of coursework. So, and these are additive, obviously. You get 10 marks if you use a sophisticated use of Ajax, right, because it also includes the simple use of Ajax. But if you just have simple, you're only going to get four marks. Testing. So there'll be a lecture on testing. I'm expecting you to do, run all these kinds of tests, so HTML, CSS validation, front-end functional testing with Selenium, JavaScript unit tests, and PHP unit tests. There's two and a half marks for each of these kinds of tests. Um, and what I'm asking you to do for this piece of coursework is to implement the tests and run the tests. I'm not expecting you to pass the tests, okay? So it's fine um, to do some, as long as you do the validation, I don't care whether it passes the validation, um, I'm just, the marks are for running the tests learning how the testing works. And then there's two and a half marks for JavaScript code quality and two and a half marks for PHP code quality. And then there's the final report. So I want a clear description of you know, what the project, the final e-commerce website does. Um, I want, you get, you know, you're gonna lose marks if you don't include the contribution spreadsheet. Um, you've got to list the third party libraries and you've got to uh, document the tests, okay? So you've got to you know, show the tests that have run. If you don't document the tests, you're not gonna get marks for the tests. There's also two and a half marks for security, privacy, and legal issues. So I want you to discuss the ones that are relevant to the website um, based upon the material I've given you in the lecture and suggest how they could be addressed, but I'm not expecting you to address them all, obviously. Okay, I think we're there. So this has been an overview of Coursework 2, the e-commerce website. There'll be a Q&A session dedicated to this where I'll run through some of this stuff. 
and answer any questions you've got. I strongly recommend you read the assessment criteria carefully. And next few lectures, we're going to crack on with the actual technology you need for your e-commerce website. And I'm going to start off with uh, MongoDB.